you write about how during the years of being a partisan, you came very close to death. All the time, Inc including stupid things that I did. <laughs> uh, we did a raid and uh, turned out that in the raid we discovered that the person in the raid had an old pistol. Since I was the only guy in the group who didn't have a pistol, they said, well, give Strassman this pistol. So I was happy as can be. At the evening fire, I decided, uh, at the evening uh, 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 dinner uh, around the fire, I decided to clean the weapon. Well, the weapon went off. And it went between the two heads of the leading guys of the squad. They said if I would have shot anybody or even wounded anybody, they would have sh killed me right on the spot. So the discipline was extremely severe. Tell me another instance where your life was in danger. Oh my God. Um, there was one case where I was young and disposable more disposable than the others. I was usually sent ahead of everybody else into the village to see if it's occupied or if somebody is there. So I go into this village. For reasons that I did not know, I took my rifle and instead of carrying it on my shoulder, I carried the rifle behind my coat. I walk into the street and right in front of the street is a German motorcycle with a machine gun staring at me. Now, if I would have run, they would have cut me down. But because the rifle was behind my coat, I just turned around nice and slowly and just walked into the next gate and, and, and walked behind the village to get out. So, so there's, life is full of incidents like that. Mm -hmm. There was another kind where we went, we went to raid a train. And when you lay uh, a, a TNT under the rail, there is a trick for doing it. You would dig up the ballast, the, 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 the broken stone, and then put it under. The idea then is to blow up the rail but blow up the rail after the heavy part of the train, which is, consists of the, what's called the tender that carries the coal and the water, goes over the broken rail and then derails the whole train. Uh, the idea was that I would be carrying the blasting caps, the, the, the blasting caps which start the explosion by the way, the train was coming. We could see the train coming, or we could see the, the, the lights of the train. They said, give me, the, give me the ignition caps. I gave him the ignition caps. I kept the ignition caps in a capsule. In the excitement, I spilled the capsule. Now, the ignition caps were the most precious thing that the Parsons had. We had enough ammunition, but we did not have the ignition caps. So the commander says, I'm getting out of here, but you stay here until you pick up all the ignition caps. So I stayed to the very last moment. I almost got blown up. When I returned, they assumed that I lost the caps. They said, well, we'll have to now execute you. I said, sorry, gentlemen, I have the caps with me and pulled out the caps out of my pocket, where they were loosely located in my pocket, which was inexcusable because even the slightest hit against the ground would have blown off my, 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 my whole body, would have made a hole in my body. Mm -hmm. So 
I pull out all of the ignition caps out of my pocket and I show them. <laughs> and they say, you were lucky, SOB. You got away from execution again. You, uh, this is full of incidents like that. You know, in the movies, the life of partisans is somewhat romanticized. And we had the movie Defiance. Oh, that, that is awful. That is so Tell me bad. why it's awful. I mean, the, the girls come out out of the bunker with perm, with hair uh, f fixed up in, with a permanent uh, hairdress. I mean, that is unthinkable. We were filthy. We were filthy. We were unwashed. We were stinking. All Was the there time. anything, I'm not meaning romantic in the love sense between men and women. I'm talking about romantic in the sense of literature, gallantry. Was there anything about was there anything romantic about your life as a partisan? Well, to me, it was another form of hell. Uh, some of the Russian partisans, who uh, some of them were being thrown into the partisan warfare uh, for the second time by by the by the commissars. Uh, these people were looking at the time when they were in, in the partisans with the Slovaks as an opportunity for liberation. And there were women who lived with these guys. You know, we were all cooped up in dugouts, so-called Zemlanka, this, these are th improvised short-term underground living quarters. So all kinds of stuff was going on. Sexual stuff? Sexual stuff, of course. For you too? For me, I was a kid. I was trying to survive. The idea of looking at a girl or anything like that was just, just beyond belief. Mm -hmm. You went on missions, so you would blow up a train. Did you ever have to kill anybody? I have no idea. I have no idea. Now, we did a number of ambush. Uh, we ambushed patrols. We ambushed truck routes. We ambushed uh, uh, two trucks, which were full of uh, the black shirts. I have no idea okay. who, who got killed or who, who didn't get killed. Was that kind of operation exhilarating? Of course not. It was frightful. We were scared. I was scared all the time. I was scared around the clock all the time against the slightest possibility of, of uh, making a mistake or, or being caught or or uh, dying of frost. Uh, my whole period in partisans from, uh, which was almost eight and a half months, was one of continual fear and, and horror. Did you ever cry? No. Because? No, uh, crying, you didn't cry. No, nobody ever cried. Uh, they, they, nobody even thought about it. Did you feel sorry for yourself? Oh, you, you, you felt very bad and you just tried to live the next day or the next hour, as, as the case may be, depending. When you were in an ambush, you were just hoping that uh, by the time the ambush is over, uh, you're, you're not going to get hit. But, but uh, the, the dominant theme of my experience was terror. Did you feel you were doing any good? They did not even cross my mind. It was all about survival. It's all survival. And you must understand, there is a very strong strain in me that goes back uh, 
back to my father. And you also must understand, after the war, uh, I was extremely well received by the Slovak army. The Slovak army gave me great honors. And then when I came to the United States, for some unforeseen reasons, the American army somehow discovered that I have some kind of talents that they can use. And totally unexpectedly, in, uh, after the uh, communist regime collapsed, they were looking for somebody to, uh, to come in into the Department of Defense. And they looked at lots of people. And there was something among the generals that I was shot at. In other words, there were all kinds of Harvard Business School experts and professors and what have you who were going to be appointed to a high position in the Department of Defense. Somehow the fact that I was a guy who was in the trenches and was shot at was credible. So uh, I show up in the Department of Defense and they say, oh, by the way, Mr. Strassman, because of the job you have to do, we are moving you up to, into the executive quarters. Uh, by the way, you ought to know I was only three layers away from the president. That was my position. My position was that of a lieutenant general. They gave me a suite, a big staff, a tremendous responsibility. And this is all traced back to the, the, your experience they in the smell the, 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 the army. I have still very strong connections with the army. I ultimately ended up teaching at West Point. I ended up teaching at West Point. So, so there is a long strain of Strassman Association with the tough world of fighting, of survival. What happens to this partisan experience that it comes to an end? Well, what happens is uh, we are totally decimated, sick. Uh, I'm, I have bleeding pleurisy. I have frostbite on my feet, but my lungs were bleeding. In March 25th, uh, we crossed the line, the battle line between the Germans and the, and the Russians. Immediately after we crossed the line, uh, the, at the other end is the NKVD, who sorts out uh, all the potential Russians who pretend they were partisan, but in fact they were running away from the, from the Russians. NKVD was uh, the original secret police. And, and uh, when they looked at me, said, well, you are a Jew, Jew boy, you just go into uh, wherever you want to go. And I said, well, I want to go into the army. So they said, well, they need you. So they shipped me to the Slovak army. In, the, in those days, it was a Czechoslovak army. And, uh, and uh, I showed up at the headquarters of the uh, Czechoslovak army. And they say, oh, you are a partisan. We need you. So they decided, and this is still in March before the end of the war, that they need a squad of cutthroats who would go into Western Czechoslovakia and do what's called ethnic cleansing. And I was just a guy for that. So uh, they put me through a two-week officer training course. Uh, I was too young to get an officer commission, so they made me a corporal. But that was, they made me a corporal on the day when the war ended. So, but I went from the partisans directly into the Czechoslovak army. What do you mean that you are the perfect person for ethnic cleansing? 
Well, I was, <laughs> uh, uh, I was reckless. I was a risk taker. I hated Germans. I, uh, my rifle had the word vengeance on it. Uh, they, they needed people who will go in to so-called Sudetenland. The Germans during 1938 occupied part of Czechoslovakia and moved Germans there. So we were going to clean the, the whole area of all the Germans. Yes, the ethnic cleansing was of Germans. Of course. We were going to ethnic cleanse the rest of Czechoslovakia of Germans. As it turned out, you never had to do that. Never had to do it because the Germans ran away to the West. They so what went. about liberation and the end of the war? What was that like? The end of the war. The end of the war was a sort of a non-event. You know, the, the people were making noise. Uh, people were shooting weapons. Do you remember, though, how it happens? Oh, they just announced the end of the war is here. That's all. Did it come as a surprise? I was in officer training course. Uh, I was already being set up for what comes after the war. Uh, to me, the only question was not if there's the end of the war, but on which day it will come. So what happened to the rest of your family? Well, I... I took my Tommy gun and my new uniform and went back to the town, to the house where my parents were. Uh, it was, of course, occupied by, by the people who my father gave the store to. And they were petrified when they saw me with my Tommy gun uh, and immediately gave me the best bedroom and and, but nobody was home, nobody, nobody knew who was where, neither the father, mother, uncles. There's a whole list of a family. Uh, and then, of course, I was assigned as a military aide, as a, actually a bodyguard to the, a colonel of the NKPD who needed a bodyguard. I don't know why he needed a bodyguard, but they wanted me, he wanted to have a bodyguard. And while I was a bodyguard in Bratislava, I kept going daily to the Jewish agency that had a cork board because all the Jews who were coming back from concentration camp were posting their whereabouts, who is survived, who is alive, and who is where. And suddenly the name of my sister pops up. So uh, I met my sister. Where? In, in, in Trenchin. And, and uh, she, she was in love with the only Jew who remained in Slovakia. He was a man who courted her for years. And he survived by being walled in behind a wall, an artificial wall that was put into a corridor. In other words, when the Germans came in 44, his friends built a wall in a corridor, so the corridor was actually shorter. And he slipped behind the wall, and from the, at the bottom of the wall, they were giving him food every day. So this guy survived. When he survived, he was very sick, but he, my, my sister married him anyway. He died shortly thereafter. And your parents? Oh, they never returned. How do you, do you know what happened to them? Uh, I get partial stories. There are people who knew about it or heard about it. The, the final conclusion was that both my mother and my father died of typhus towards the end of the war. 
they, 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 they lived for five months in, in, in a concentration camp and then towards the end of the time, and I don't know exactly the time, uh, there was disease, there was massive disease in those concentration camps. Both my mother and my father died. You were very sick at the end as a partisan, correct? I was very sick, but uh, that didn't stop me. And I was sick with my stomach for the next uh, 15 years until I came to America, where I met this girl, this 17-year-old girl, who somehow took a liking to me. I, I was really a, a run-down, uh, slightly nervous young man. Were you? Because and to look at you now, there's none of that. And, and Yes, uh, she, there's none of that now. She, she's a un very unusual girl, Mona, and, and um, she said, I want to marry you. And that was it. You did. So, you know, I, we've been married now 63 years. Mazal Tov. I wanted to know, however, when you come out of the mountains, how do you survive? How do you begin to heal? You, you're frostbitten. You're emaciated. You're hungry. And for all the time, eight months, you were frightened all the time. Where do you go and how do you begin to heal? You don't heal. Healing is not an issue. The issue is survival. In other words, the, the underlying force that drives the Jews for the last 3,000 years is one of survival. And the question is, how do you survive? How, what do you do to live in a hostile environment? What kind of adaptations do you make? And for me, that was very simple. Uh, I've always followed a rule, a very simple rule of survival, namely when confronted with any situation, you pick the situation which has more, most options. In other words, never pick a course which has a predetermined outcome or a predetermined direction. My approach to survival is always look at choices and pick a choice that gives you more opportunities, multiple ways of surviving, because you never know which of the ways of surviving is actually going to be the one that's going to pay off. So I'm continually Gambling, in other words, it's, it's, it's a, uh, my idea of, of living as a Jew for 2,000 years or 100 years or five years is to play a game, and the game is one of choice. And the choice that gives you more opportunities to live is the choice that you're likely to choose. When I was sitting in the house in the September of 1944, one choice was to stay with the, that employee and stay hidden in their house. Well, there was only one choice out of that. that they, they either will keep me or they betray me. My rule was that that approach to survival is not acceptable. The other choice was to sit next to the river and go where the machine guns were firing and go with a group of people, of Russian guys, who were basically uh, guerrillas with totally unpredictable outcome. And I always took that choice. In other words, when I look back at my life, 
whether it is my choice of the Department of Defense or the choice of Xerox or the choice of my wife, I've always chosen the high risk, high gambling options. So that is how you survive. The, the operative purpose of a Jew in this hostile world is to survive. By the way, there are some people who argue that if a Jew of Eastern Europe or during the Holocaust did not end up in a concentration camp, they are not survivors. And there are others who argue anyone, any Jew who was in Europe during the Nazi night of the Holocaust, any Jew is a survivor. In fact, even Jews who left Germany early, but once it was already part of the German machine, people call them survivors. Well, I, Do you uh, consider yourself a survivor? Absolutely not. The word survivor is a connotation of not acting with will. See, the important part of existence is the exercise of free will of a human being. A survivor just sits there and the survival is granted to him or her. I'm basically a fighter. I, I, want, I want to live, I want to do everything to possibly to move the odds of living in my favor. I'm a gambler. The word survivor does not contain the moral underlying rationale of behavior. And this is very important because I've seen lots of Jews who have gone to the railroad station because they were told to go to the railroad station. That is not surviving. That is, you, you basically abdicate yourself to a one-way train to, towards oblivion. Are you critical of them? I'm not critical. I am describing what captivates me very much is the question of what is what is the survival of Jews over the next 50 to 100 years? I look at the future of the Jews uh, very darkly, particularly on the survival of Israel. Because? I am extremely apprehensive because I view everything from a military standpoint, because if, if there is no force, all the other details don't matter. And so I'm looking at the military capability of Israel with its declining ability to recruit young men into the army, as diminishing and losing ability to, of, of existence. And therefore, I'm very much concerned about what will happen to the future of Jews when things are going to go to the seventh level of hell. And by the way, uh, Mark, one of the things that I would like to do with you is to plead with you, is to do what I was always considered in a military standpoint as contingency planning. And the contingency planning for the American Jewry would be to save Jewish children when the time comes. If you have a, What do you mean when the time comes? A, atomic attack on, on Israel. You believe that's possible? Absolutely, yes. It almost sounds as if you'd be more surprised if it didn't happen. I would be more surprised if it didn't happen. The 
again, you have to look at things from a military standpoint, which is contingency. When you do contingency planning, you have to look at the worst scenario first, which is surviving. All the other questions of prosperity or, or trade or uh, knowledge or, and so forth all go down to a second level or third or fourth level of importance when conditions create possibility of obliteration. And my reading of, 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 of Israel, which fills me with enormous apprehension, is that the contingency for an atomic attack on Israel in the next 30 to 50 years cannot be dismissed. During your years as a partisan, did you ever consider that after the war you would try to go to Palestine? Of course I did. I went to Palestine. I went in Palestine uh, uh, because all my associates from Trenchin went to Kibbutz Dalia. So I went to Israel as an employee of a Jewish agency to survey land. But this is after 48 after the state is established? Yeah, after the state. Did you ever consider being part of those who were, right after the war, many Jews went to Palestine? Did that ever occur to you? Of course it did. That's why I went to Israel to see whether it's going to fit me. When? I went to in 1950. Okay, but you didn't go immediately after the war. Not immediately after the war. Was there a reason? Circumstance or desire? Well, uh, there were circumstances that had to do with the fact that, that in 1946-47, uh, I was engaged in just recovering my health and my, my sanity. I left in 1948 Slovakia. In other words, this was one of the situations which is my arithmetic of, of looking at contingency. I said, I cannot live in, in Slovakia. I have to get out of Slovakia. So I went to England. And I started looking at my future in the Spring of 1948, I was seriously considering to go to Israel as a fighter and concluded that that would not really be the right choice because I wanted to get an education. You must understand I had no education. I didn't go to school since uh, the 1939, so I did not even have high school education. So when I look at the trade-offs as a human being for survival, my number one priority was to get an education. And that's what I did. I came to the United States in 48. In 49, I went to Cooper Union. Did you have family here? No, no family. You came all alone? All alone. I have always been, until Israel came, uh, came here, I was always apprehensive about the militancy of the Jewish population. That it wasn't strong enough. Wasn't strong enough. With the exception of Hashem and Hatzair and the people who went to kibbutz to survive. Very often there's the criticism, the cliche criticism I grew up with that the Jewish population of Europe went meekly like lambs to the slaughter. And there is criticism of the Jewish community embedded in that statement. Paul, are you making that statement 
And are you critical of the Jewish community that went to the train and got in the boxcar? Well, you are simplifying the whole thing. Because it's not just the act of going to the train. It requires a mental orientation towards fighting. It requires a culture rooted in resistance. In other words, it's not just going meekly to, to, the, to the cattle cars. This is just a final act of, of, of giving up. What I object to is the culture, which is not militant enough, which is not strong enough, which is not educated enough, hasn't learned enough of what are the ways by which one can deal with these extreme conditions. So I cannot blame them for going meekly to the cattle cars. What I can blame is much of the rabbinical culture of not emphasizing force as a sufficient cultural capability for living. And you know, and, and there were Jews in the 12th or 13th century who were who were who were fighting, who who were militant. My father was a, one of the rare officers, so I, so I carry this idea with me as a part of a culture, rather than just an act of 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 giving up. I would like to see the Jewish culture for the next hundred years to be much more militant, to be trained, to be educated on militancy, to be educated. All of my kids are sharpshooters. All of my kids are involved in, in survival. All of my kids are Eagle Scouts. I mean, there is much more to, to living in a hostile world than just whether you do or don't go to the railroad station. What I'm blaming the rabbis is the lack of visible education and training and experience as to the way how a culture can survive. Clearly, Israel is part of my hope that this kind of militant thinking, which is embedded in the, idea, in, in, the, in the fact that all the young people have to go to the army and get trained. I, I absolutely understand that. My position on that thing, this is wonderful, but it's not sufficient. Because the survival of Jews on a global basis depends on the militancy of the American Jews, of the Brazilian Jews, of the, of the uh, Argentinian Jews. In other words, I would like the question of militancy be part of the, the, the teaching of what Judaism is all about. Maccabees, it, it is uh, Masada, in, in all of that. In other words, I'm sitting here in a Jewish broadcasting organization, which is the possibility of having an enormous influence on the future of Judaism on a global basis. And the question is, what can the Jewish organization do from a cultural standpoint, because uh, when I listen to the rabbis, you know, and, and, I, and I've been looking for a rabbi to bury me, which is a figurative thing. Mark, I've been looking for somebody to bury me who I can respect, who will do the honors to me. 
is a fighter. And I had great difficulty. I was looking for that capability in lots of places. I was dating a girl for three years. And she just, 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 her father was a jeweler. His, the, the arrangement was, I'm poor, but the father will make sure I get support because I don't have to work. I can study Talmud. <laughs> well, that was the end of, of my affection for a girl. One thing that I like about my wife, she's a militant. You come to America. You build a life for yourself. You get married to Mona. How many children? Four children. How many grandchildren? Seven. You become a major figure in the U.S. Defense Department. I certainly was. And then you have a wonderful career with Xerox. Yeah. You've made a contribution to this country and society in many ways. Yeah. So reflect for me. You're a child that comes out of the horror, this, all the steps of hell you've described. You spend eight months in, and you say to us in total honesty, I was scared every moment. There was nothing romantic about being a partisan. But you survive. You come to America. You survive because of your action. You come to America and you build a spectacular life. Can you reflect upon your own journey and what it says as a microcosm of contemporary Jewish life? My son Andrew married a rabbi. My uh, daughter is married to somebody who is a descendant of the Gaons from Vilna. I'm looking for the existence of Jews 50, 100 years from now. And am I a model for that? And the answer is yes, I think so, because I have always in my consciousness lived in the society that gave me a living, which is America. In other words, the, the, the Americans are very pleased with having me as part of their community. In other words, they feel that I've done a service to this country. But that's not all. That survives me as an American, but it doesn't survive me as a Jew. To survive as a Jew, you must start thinking of the, the patterns of living that made Jews live through through thousands of years of, of terrible depredation and suffering. And the question is, what elements remained common to all those people who remained Jews? And the answer is that these are people who, to their best knowledge, were able to live in a world which is going to be extremely hostile and may require resort to force, maybe, as a way of keeping on with life. I'm very proud that I fought, that I know my father fought, I know my son is devoted to scholarship of medieval uh, fighting. Um, the, the Guys who are in New Canaan, the, the Chabadniks, are people who have taken a totally different direction of how to survive. Ultimately, they may be right. I have no way of knowing. But it is my militant fighting Jew position versus the Chabadniks that will ultimately be decided what will be the future of Judaism.
right now I would rather bet on me. This has been an honor for me to sit with you. It's mutual. Uh, That's sweet of you to say, but you, no, it, you are a real gibor. You're a hero of Jewish life. Also in terms of what you stand for, what you hope for, you give a message that's very important for all of us to hear. I wish you only kol tuva hatzlecha and long life. And There's a lot more to talk to you about that has nothing to do with the Shoah. And you and I will do that. But it's been a pleasure and an honor. I thank I, you, my friend. I Mark, thank you. I thank you very much. I haven't had an opportunity like this in a long, long time to talk to somebody as understanding as yourself, Mark. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.